Okay, hello. Hopefully that has got me uh, live. I am just waiting a second to see if I come up on this uh, other computer. Ah, there we go. Watch live video. Great. That means I can see the comments as they come through. So um, uh, welcome everybody. Um, my name is Oliver Wright. Um, I'm a wildlife and macro photographer and uh, Camera World and Canon have invited me to sort of talk about sort of garden photography and sort of close to the garden photography. So let me just check that looks like it's working from here. So it looks like I've got a comment there from Dave Amber. Hello from Hockley, Essex. Hello there, Dave. Um, so excellent. That does look like everything is working. Um, excellent. Camera World have messaged in there. So I think that looks good. Great. Right. Well, a massive thanks to uh, Camera World um, for inviting me to do this talk and to uh, Canon for sponsoring it. Uh, like I said, my name is uh, is Oliver Wright. And yeah, I'm going to be talking about garden photography. Um, and I'm going to sort of cut, go through a bit of background um, and then I'm going to sort of jump into uh, photography, um, photography in my garden. So just and lots of different bits of photography I've I've done in my garden. Um, I'm I'm sure we've all done a lot more a lot more time in. Um, we've all spent a lot more time in our garden over over, over the last year. Um, and, and really, my garden's about sort of birds and macro. I've not got a particularly big garden. Um, and then I'm just going to sort of mention. A few, I'm going to go into just a few other gardens where I've done some photography and just some sort of. Um, Sometimes I've bumped into wildlife in the house as well. Uh, and, and then I'm going to spend a bit of time about one subject I found in the garden um, over, over, uh, it was over the winter actually, and it's a subject I had never seen in the garden before. Um, then I'm going to cover a bit on bird feeders. Um, then going to sort of just, we'll see how we're doing for time. I've, I've put quite a lot into this uh, into this presentation and a, a little bit further out and then we'll sort of probably finish and ask for questions as well. So just as a bit of housekeeping, like I said, I'm sort of running on two computers um, so I can see Stuart. Hello there, Zoe, Sean, Phil. Hi there, everybody. So th there's, there's a few seconds delay between what I'm saying to this computer and how everything pops up on this. So I will sort of try and answer questions as I, um, as I see them popping up on here. Um, right. So I just see, I've just seen somebody make a comment, um, with a link on it, whatever you do, don't click that link. That just looks like somebody who's uh, spamming this. So um, <laughs> ignore anybody who posts any links that on on the comments, unless it's Camera World. To totally ignore them. So okay, let me go through. And just as another bit of housekeeping, I am sat at home. Um, my dog is over there. So if anybody uh, knocks on the door or the postman arrives, you're going to hear the um, you're going to hear the dog barking. Uh, Hopefully we won't have that, but we, we may do. Um, and you never know, somebody might call me. If they do, I'll, I'll sort of hang up, but I want to leave my uh, my phone live. Um, but we shall crack on. So just uh, some of you, I did a couple of uh, these Facebook lives for Camera World last year. Um, but I've, I've changed the presentation to how I do these now. Before, at the beginning of lockdown, I was, um, I was sort of, streaming in off my phone, um, having problems with light coming through the wind, window, etc. So I've totally changed the way I do that now. So we've got sort of a presentation which has got pictures, bullet points, um, but hopefully you, you can see me sort of moving at the top right of the screen. Um, and I think this is a better way of doing this. So uh, I've just put a little bit here in terms of my short history, uh, and I guess as to uh, why I've ended up um, talking in front of you guys. So for me, photography was sort of climbing and, and holiday snaps for a lot of years um, and then I, I did a trip to South America in I think 2007 I took a sabbatical from work um, and then I had an accident in in 2010 um, and the two pictures at the top here one's me coming down the Matterhorn before accident on the right is me getting stretched away from um, from, from Brim and Rocks with a, with a smashed up ankle and that left me with um, with a whole load of time where I used to spend the time climbing beforehand um, and it was at that point that I got to sort of learn how to how to use a camera. And I'd had a corporate job uh, prior to that, working full time as a project manager. But once I 
got to learn my camera properly, I decided I was going to I was going to leave that in February two thousand and fourteen. And since then, I've been been working as a photographer. Um, I've been spending my winters in Nabisco and then my summers in the UK. And then obviously, we're in this sort of global pandemic situation. Um, so. I'm going to cover this one first and then go backwards. So, so me now-ish, um, generally summer times, I spend a lot of time um, doing macro work, photographing um, locally and a bit further afield normally. And then in winter time, I've been working up in Abisko, northern Sweden, for the last six years, um, taking people out to photograph the northern lights, etc. Uh, Again, whoever that MMRRF person is, you know, don't click on that link. Only click on a Camera World link on there. Um, so, and just a quick disclaimer, because we are going to be going through, um, yeah, some instructional stuff on here. Um, and I always put a disclaimer in when we do this because often there's more than one way to get to the same result on photography. And um, so, you know, every, everybody has their own techniques. Um, everybody's always learning. I know I am. I know things have changed quite a lot. This uh, the way I've done things this year. And pardon the pun, but you know, often things are black and white. So some of the things I suggest in terms of the way I do things might not necessarily suit yours. So in my garden, and some of this is from a few years ago, and and some of this is 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 really really recent. Hi there, Wendy. Will this be recorded so you can I can watch later? It will be. Yeah, um, you just have to go back onto the Camera World site, and you would be able to watch the video video later on. Ah, sorry. So this is this is in my garden from a few years ago. Uh, so I, I put a little bit of an icebreaker here. So a few a few years ago, when I was working in northern Sweden, this was actually my back garden. Um, so I was living in a little mountain cabin next to a ski resort called Bjorkleden. And I was there for, for four months and this was, I mean, it was decking really, but the decking was covered in snow and this was my front garden. And I actually took this photograph on, on March the 6th. I remember it because March the 6th is my birthday. So it was um, about three, four years ago to uh, today, um, very close to today. And I don't know if you can see in this picture, there's a really obvious part of there's Northern Lights going off there. But I don't know if you can see there's some tiny little footprints in the snow and I'd, I'd noticed these footprints after moving in this cabin um, and like I said this was this was my front garden um, and when I looked at the footprints I thought oh they're they're um, they're ermine tracks which um, this is this is the ermine and I'd been in that cabin maybe three months thinking when am I going to see this ermine and this was my first view of the ermine after about three months. And this photograph was taken with my phone pressed up against the window window when it was dark, um, which is why it's so pixelated and, and terrible. Um, but then in the very last morning of um, just before I moved out of that cabin, I got up, had coffee, and um, there there popped up the um, there popped up the ermine. Literally, as so I'm actually shooting this through a window. And it shows you how level, how, how high the snow is outside the window. Um, and these are this absolutely beautiful little um, predator that, that you get there up in, in northern Sweden. So I managed to get a, a couple of photographs of it. It could tell I was there. Um, and here you can see it, it's looking directly towards me. But I think because of the way the light was showing, it couldn't see me behind the glass. So I, I had this sort of fabulous experience after being in this cabin for uh, for four months. Um, the final day, getting pictures of, of this ermine, and then finally, there's um, this big U shape in the background is a is a really famous mountain view in Sweden called the Porten, and um, the ermine jumped up on the handrail which went around the balcony, and I got this photograph of this ermine with the Porten in the background, which was is probably my most sort of magical just out of the front of the house house pictures but actually in my current back garden i do not have anything as as, as exotic as a as a, as ermines running around um so like i said like i said earlier my back garden is 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 much more around sort of birds and insects um, but obviously, you know, now we're just in the back end of February. So I have, you know, over the last few months, it's been more about photographing birds in the back garden. 
So two, two other people there with uh, their birthdays on the 6th of March, obviously a, a popular day. So, but what, what's really nice to see in the back garden at the moment is it is starting to come back alive with insects. And um, I'm gonna show you a video after this tip section, which I literally did just 20 minutes ago in the garden. I'd gone out into the garden to have a little break um, and I, I got this video, but tip, tips for sort of gardens really. Um, and I've put the irony because um, I, I sort of use my garden and the fact that I want to photograph wildlife in it as a good excuse to leave the garden quite messy, um, especially for, 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 for macro. Um, you know, I've, I've got like a hedge area, which we're just going to see in the video in a second, which I leave quite, quite messy um, because I want lots of leaf area in there for, for, for bugs to feel quite comfortable. Um, also, you know, you, you want your birds to be able to sort of jump around in, you know, you, you want to cut your grass, etc. But yeah, it's um, you want the birds to have a, a fairly natural type environment. Um, in terms of other tips, obviously, you know, birds will come for food, um, but you have to make sure it's the right food. Um, you know, you don't really want to be feeding birds bread, etc. But fat balls, etc. The proper bird food you can buy from from um, yeah, decent outdoor centres, etc. Um, but it also works for balconies too because you know not everybody has got gardens but if you put bird feeders out or feeds I mean I, I use the walls and the fences a lot in, in my garden for putting bird food down as well um, and, and the other things to really think about is you know think about where the sun is going to be um, outside of your house windows so whether you would be looking out of a front window in the morning and then back window in the afternoon where does the sun sort of travel around your garden and therefore you know when are you going to be sort of backlighting subjects versus front lighting subjects etc um, and obviously because you get to spend lots of time around your garden you can really think about where the sun is going to be but it will also allow you to think about the effect that that has on your pictures as well so whether a bird is backlit or whether it's frontlit has a, has a massive difference on the pictures but because it's your garden and you can spend lots of time there you'll really see the impact of, of, of where the sun is and how that makes your pictures look so and think about what wildlife you see at different times of the day as well um, you know, you, you might have hedgehogs that come out at night time. Um, what time do your macro subjects come out? Um, what time are the birds more active, etc. And and also think about backgrounds. Um, yeah, obviously when you photograph a subject, um, the background has 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 a big impact, and we will cover a chunk of that later on as well. So this is a video um, I literally just took in my back garden, um, yeah, literally 20, sec uh, 20 minutes ago. Um, so this is my garden fence just here, which we're going to see. This garden fence is going to be in a number of the pictures. So just 10 minutes before the talk is due to start, I've just seen a one shield bug there, one ladybird there. Another shield bug there. There's two there a minute ago. Oh, another shield bug down there. Another one there. Amazing how quickly they're all coming out. So pretty gobsmacking that um, the macro life seems to be getting there in, in, in good numbers really quickly and early this year. Um, I don't know in terms of where everybody is on here. I know lots of people have said where they were in terms of Hereford Island, etc. So people are all over the place. Um, but it, it, up here in Yorkshire, it, you know, just a week and a half ago, it was really, really cold. So I wasn't expecting to see large numbers of shield bugs on my hedge quite, quite, quite so ready. Um, so it's really, really good to see. And which means after this call is finished, I may well head out into my garden with, with my camera. So these first couple of pictures, um, I've just put them here as sort of situational. So this is one of the things I do. This is the um, a little wall which goes around the, uh, the back of my garden. And I'll often just put seed down on those walls and, and get the birds so they know they can go down there and feed. Um, and feel sort of quite relaxed about it. So was, there's a couple of uh, house sparrows. I have quite a few house sparrows that live around the house. 
And here you go again, you know, just one of the sparrows um, with some of the food I put down on that wall. So because I put the food down on that wall and there's a, um, a on, on this fence down here as well, I, I know, you know, regularly I will have birds coming into the garden um, all the way through, all the way through the day. Here's some juvenile starlings from uh, from last summer, taking some uh, mealworms off the off the fence. And also next doors have a have a bird bath, um, and bird baths are um, bird baths are great uh, in terms of birds coming to the garden. Um, you get action shots, etc. And here as well, it, it, it's worth just thinking about the light a little bit. So the sparrows there in the bird bath. And obviously the sun is shining down on the sparrow's head. Um, but I know on, a, on an afternoon now, if birds come to this bird bath, and when you see me looking that way, I'm actually looking at the bird bath. Um, if birds come into that bird bath in the afternoon and it's sunny, I know the birds will be here in sort of splendid light and the background goes all black because there's a, there's a hedgerow behind there that doesn't catch the sun. So I've, I've got about an hour and a half window worth of opportunity that if birds go in that bird bath, it's really, really good for photography. And because the sun is hitting the water drops and they all spray up and you've got that, you've got that black background, it shows all of those, all of those really nicely. Um, so bird baths are also a really good thing to stick in the garden if you wanted to do some um, garden photography. But even if you just had a balcony as well, you know, if you put a big flat plastic tray somewhere, um, somewhere safe, which is not going to get blown off, birds will come to drink from it. Here more bird bath fun with a male and female sparrow, uh, but really good for those sort of dynamic shots with loads of water exploding, exploding around. A bit more, she's looking on a little bit more, a little bit un unencouragingly there. Trudy had butterflies in the back garden here yesterday. Now that I am very jealous of. I haven't seen any butterflies here yet. And hi there, Bernie from uh, from Ireland. So here we've got a starlings in the bird bath as well. Um, I often get uh, wood pigeons coming to this bird bath as well, but they barely fit in it. Uh, but starlings, I think, are um, yeah, they're such a fantastic bird to photograph. Um, especially, you know, if they've been in a bird bath or not, you get these amazing colours on the feathers. They're a really sort of underestimated bird to, um, to, to photograph. John Clayton, what lens and settings? Um, so I would use um, a variety of lenses, either my um, Canon 100 to 400 um, mil um, L lens. I, I use a Mark II for those. Um, but I've, I've also got a, a 500mm uh, prime um, uh, L, but the, the old one, the old version. So if I need a little bit more length and a bit more light, I, I would use a 500. Uh, in terms of settings, um, it pretty, it's quite tricky to say because it, each shot would be different. So if it's a photograph like this with, um, with a starling that's being still, I'm not going to be too worried about the shutter speed as long as I've got enough shutter speed to be able to hold the camera um, steady in my hands. So if I was using a 400mm I'd want to be using at least 400 per second. If I'm using a 500mm I'd want 500 per second. But if I just jump back uh, for these type of shots with birds spraying about water um, I would want a much uh, faster shutter speed because I want to try and freeze that water as much as possible. So you know, I'd be looking at, ideally, if I could get away with it, about you know one two and a half, uh, one two thousandth of a second or one three thousandth of a second. So I would adjust everything accordingly. So this one I would probably be shooting with a much higher ISO as well. So. It's really dependent on, on, on the situation. So birds that are stationary, um, I would just be looking at a shutter speed, which is enough for me to be hand holding it. And then I would generally be shooting these um, with quite a wide aperture. So I would be shooting uh, probably at the widest aperture that that lens would do. So if it was on the 100 to 400, I would be shooting at 5.6. Um, if I was shooting on the 500mm, I'd be shooting at f4. And one of the reasons for that is I would try to be blurring the background out as much as possible.
but feel free to ask questions on settings as we go through these guys because there's there, there's quite a lot of different images here um, and I will help out wherever where wherever I can on that a juvenile or a young blackbird at least in the uh, in the back garden looking a bit quizzical at me as you can see my grass there is uh, is, is fairly long um, and then another starling so this one is actually out of the front window um, and earlier in the day is, is better at my front window but again that yeah, super beautiful iridescence on the uh, on, on the feather structures there they, they are, really are a stunning bird and so often as well I will try to do um, I will try to do two versions and we'll cover this a bit more when we get into the uh, bird feeder section a little bit later on so I will often sort of try and photograph a whole bird but obviously here it's a little bit messy we've got that grass we've got those mealworms and then I'll quite often try to do more of a more of a portrait as well on, on a bird so this this was a juvenile starling from my garden um, last summer um, I, mean, I, I think this is probably my favourite of my uh, uh, bird photographs from in the garden last summer. Um, and on, on this one, this, it's, it's where I said to people, think about the light um, and what time you want to you wanna be shooting, etc. This was actually taken um, in, the, in quite harsh sunlight, really, um, just at the beginning of that window that I mentioned before, where this back hedge goes into shade. Um, but I've got quite harsh sunlight. So what I've done on this image is I deliberately underexposed the image quite significantly um, so that the, the background has gone completely black, but I've got this sort of isolated section of bird which, is, which has been lit up, lit up by the sun. And just a, just a standard pigeon, but again, they make pretty pretty interesting subjects. And again, here you can see I, I've gone tighter. I've gone for more of a portrait, uh, but really shows off those um, really shows off those feather details. A blackbird in the garden. Um, this one I, I'd sort of noticed was foraging. Um, and obviously, if you can get birds doing behavioural things, so whether this one's managed to pull these two bugs up um, out out of the garden. Um, you know that can be brilliant. I've seen brilliant pictures of um, people with birds collecting nesting material from their gardens as well. Uh, Tony, are you shooting the birds through the window? Um, no, for these I've, um, I've, I've, I've just been shooting from sat in the garden, but it's, it's a really good point. So th there's a couple of things there. So if you were shooting through a window, um, one of the challenges you have is you, you want to try and make sure that you've got no glare so you can you know you can try and put something you try to get the lens as close to the glass as possible um, but I, I, if, if I can not shoot through a window I, I find it much more effective so there's a couple of things that I can I do with that one is um, I'll either open the window or the back door and I'll stay just inside uh, so as to not to spook the birds but to be honest, most of the time I, I do just stay outside. Um, but I'll I'll sort of use one of my garden chairs and just sort of sit behind the garden chair a little bit. Um, but I do find if if I'm just sat out there and I'm not really moving around that much, um, the birds the birds aren't particularly bothered. Um, I mean, saying that I. I I have friends on Facebook and I see that they've, they've got pictures of another sparrowhawk making a kill in their garden, etc. I think if you were outside, that, that wouldn't really work. So you definitely want to do that from behind the window. Uh, Joyce, which editing software do you use? Um, I use I use Lightroom for uh, most of my editing, um, but I also use Photoshop if I'm having to edit anything which is a bit more complicated. Um, or also we're going to go into insect images shortly. Um, and if I'm doing my insect images, I tend to do a lot of stacking. Um, so therefore I'll do the base editing in Lightroom and then I will do the more, um, uh, I will do the stacking side of it in, in Photoshop. This is great guys, loads of questions. Uh, Heather, thank you about the photographs. Dave Amber, are you using a gimbal or a pod bing bog handheld? So uh, a, a mixture, Dave. So if, if I'm crouching behind a garden chair, I'll, I'll rest the um, tripod foot of the lens on the, just the foot of the garden chair and just sort of try to keep steady like that. Um, I may be hand holding. Um, 
if I'm using the 100 to 400, I mean, that, that lens, the Mark, well, both are, are very easy to handle, but the Mark II with the improved stabilisation, I find really easy to handhold. Um, but I often use what I call the knee as well. So if, if I'm out in the garden, again, you know, you, you want to be quite low down. Um, I'm going to have to move back to show you this. I'll, I'll sit sort of like this and I'll rest my um, tripod foot of my lens onto my knee and that just helps me keep a bit more stable. Um, but then alternatively as well, if I was doing something which was a bit of a longer stake out, um, I, I, you know, I, I may use a tripod because that just becomes, becomes so much easier. Right. Good point, Claire, um, about opening the window, close the curtains around, that, that keeps, you, keeps you really well hidden. Um, this photograph I took just on that last snowy patch, so was maybe about 10 days ago, this quite handsome wind, uh, wood pigeon, um, but again, I just, I love the, uh, the colours and the patterns on these guys. Um, and again, where we were talking about adding interest, um, I quite like this whole thing of sort of snow spraying up. And, and what all I've basically done is I'd put the I'd put the bird seeds on the back wall, um, and it was amongst the snow. So when the pigeon went down and it was sort of starting to sort of dip its beak in, there was bits of uh, bits of snow flying everywhere. Harris, just my screen to sell to a F eight hundred F eleven and. No implementation of cloudy days and F11 struggling to get sharp images. ISO not too high. Any suggestions? Um, so, what, what shutter speeds are you using, Harris? Um, that that might be the key. Um, I've not. I have. I've had a brief go on that lens, but I've not used it much. Um, but I mean, I, I was impressed by how super light it was for um, for an 800 mm lens. Um, but I would imagine you still got to get fairly. Um, fairly fast shutter speeds to be able to get it sharp even though it's got very modern um, image stabilization on it. Um, if you if you bob in the um, shutter speeds into the um, into the comments I will try to give you a heads up from there. So yes yeah, so we're leaving the um, birds in the garden section and I'm going to sort of go on the macro. Um, I haven't put that many macro images on here and then we're going to go into bird feeders. Um, but I wanted to include some just because I do do a lot of macro in the garden and all of this is is actually physically in my garden just just over there so here we've got um, a yellow dung fly and um, this one I did photograph a couple of years ago so around 800 at least I'm not sure Harris um, you could always message me outside of here and we could have a we could add a chat about it in a bit more detail because at 800 you, you should be getting sharp images I would have thought um, but yeah we, we can take that offline if you if, if you want later um, so, so this was um, this technically not in the garden they were on the kitchen window but um, just just by the garden um, on the kitchen window outside um, and this was two hoverflies mating last summer um, again I've sort of I've, I've, I've stacked this so I've taken multiple images and I have stacked them together to give me a bigger depth of field. Um, I am doing a macro talk for Camera World on the 11th of March and we'll be sort of going into macro in, in quite a lot more detail. Um, how I do the stacking, um, how I do handheld stacking versus how I do stacking on a tripod. Um, so I'm, I'm not going to go into too much more detail on, on that now. And I just thought I'd drop this one in there. I, I know it's not wildlife as such. It's the Neo, Neowise Comet. Um, I'm sure some of you all photographed the Neowise Comet last year too. Was it, I can't remember if it was June or July. Um, but this was a shot of the Neowise Comet I took from my back garden. So even though it, it didn't pass the wildlife test, it, 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 it did pass my back garden test. Another question. So I look, uh, struggling with macro when stacking the images and getting blurry parts where I've missed the focus. I've been trying with a macro rail too. Any tips driving me nuts? Hmm. I definitely come to the macro talk that we do um, that we do on the eleventh of March, um, Brian. But again, it's quite it's quite a tricky one to go through because um, there's quite a lot of different steps. But when I do that talk. 
I'm going to be going through, that one's going to be quite a lot more instructional and I'm going to be going through how I do it on a macro rail and how I do it handhold and all of the settings that I do um, as, as, as we go through that as well. Dave, how do you shoot them before they move? You have to be quick um, is, is the key because um, you, you have to sort of observe the insect wait till you see it pause and then you have to do your stack or you have to do it very early on the morning um, when the insects are still torpid but again I'll cover that in a lot more detail on the on the macro talk and um, did you shoot the bugs through a window screen and it, no I on that one I didn't I was the bugs were on the outside of the window and and so so was I um, that yeah on that one so these ones are um, garden orb spiders um, which oh, I think it was May last summer I found these and I'd never actually I had seen these out and about before um, but I'd never seen them in the garden before so um, you know your spiders last the end of last summer will have laid their will, will have laid eggs and uh, it, funnily enough I am um, on my front window on the top in the middle I've got um, I've got a little patch of eggs, um, spiders' eggs. So I'm waiting to see what they hatch out to be in about a month and a half time. And then on my patio windows, just up, up here, I've got another group of spiders' eggs that I've spotted. Um, so I'm waiting to see what they turn out to be. Um, but these ones here, um, and it literally it would have been about a meter away from where my left hand is there, just on the other side of my patio windows in between the garden fence and the wall in about about may time i was like oh wow look at look at that and there was this little cluster of garden orb spiders together um so here's and again go back to the point i mentioned right at the beginning think about the light in your garden um so when i photographed this the uh, the sun was doing one thing and on this one the sun was then going onto the back wall and two completely different images um just because of the way the sun's illuminating the background so you've got this tiny little um probably about the size of a five pence piece ball of baby spiders and i am sorry because there, there could be a few other people um who might be scared of spiders oh no questions follow up have you ever taken a shot through a window screen and if so how do you avoid um seeing a screen so um the way i've tried to do that cindy is just get as close to possible to the window so your, the front of your lens is right up against the glass. And then if, if you do that, it's not going to sort of capture you or anything else reflected in the, in the window screen because the, the, your, the front of your lens should be blocking that out. Um, you can buy, I don't know what they're called, but you can buy some sort of rubber lens hubs um, that you can clip onto the front of your um, lens, which help help you do that. Um, so I hope that helps. So, and with these spiders, one thing I did find is if you get too close, they all disperse um, and then they come back together again. So I did do a little video of that. If there's any arachnophobes are gonna have nightmares on this, but. So there you can see all the baby spiders are uh, moving around. So something for um, have 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 a look through um, have have a look through once you start to get to May time. Look out for those little balls of garden orb spiders in the garden because if you, if you find them there, you know they're both amazing to photograph um, and to video. Um, well worth to uh, well worth looking out for. Um, and another thing which is going to start appearing. Ah, lost one computer. Got it back again. Um, another thing that's going to start appearing in um, in April time is going to be hoverflies in the garden. Um, so here I've got just a number of different hoverfly shots. Um, now these are pretty pretty difficult to photograph, um, and they are super good practice for photographing things which are which are which are which are really difficult to photograph. Um, small things, fast moving around. Um, so. It's got some more questions on here, Cindy. How did you get the background so dark and blurred? Um, 
I'm not 100% sure which photograph you're referring to, sir, but how I get the backgrounds dark is thinking about where the sun's going. So um, at the bo bottom of my garden, I, I've got a, I've got a hedge, a big hedgerow of, um, of um, tight conifer trees. Now, if I pick the sun in the right at the right time of the day, um, subjects that are further down the garden are going to be illuminated, but that hedgerow is going to be is going to be in the dark. Um, so I, I pick times like that, and this hoverfly picture that I've got up now is a perfect example of that, where the hoverfly is flying in the sun, quite harsh directional sunlight, um, but I'm, I'm trying to expose the image so that the sort of hoverfly pops and the background just becomes black. Um, in terms of trying to get the backgrounds blurred, basically you just want the widest aperture that you can shoot with on that lens. So the widest aperture is the smallest number. So if you're using a lens which allows you to go to f4, shoot at f4. That will give you your narrower depth, narrowest depth of field and then your background will be more blurred. Um, the other thing which is going to make the background more blurred is, is how to explain this one in easiest terms. So the, the closer your subject is to the camera, um, the closer you get to the minimum focusing distance, the shallower your depth of field will be, and therefore the more blurred your background will be. So if you're, if you're photographing um, birds at quite a lot of distance, the background won't be that blurred. The, the closer you get to the, the bird, and the longer the focal length you're using, the more blurred out the background will be, as well as shooting with a wide aperture. So uh, it came out of the books taken with a macro lens. Um, and is a macro lens a must for book photography? That is a really good question. Um, and I can answer the um, next question as well in terms of what lens for the hoverfly. So for these ones, um, I've, um, I've often used, have I got one? I've got it just here. Yeah. Mine's a little bit battered because I've had it a lot of years and I've used it a lot. I use the Canon um, 100mm macro lens. Um, so this, this is really good for macro subjects to a certain size. So the um, those garden orb spiders I would have taken with this. Um, hoverflies I would, um, would take with this as well. Um, but back to your point, Kim. Um, you don't necessarily need a macro lens, but you do need a lens which is going to allow you sort of quite a minimum um, short focus and different distance. Let me just grab another lens. So um, here I've got a Canon R5 and the 100 to 400 mil um, Canon L lens. And this lens has a ridiculously short minimum focusing distance, um, 0.98 uh, meters, which means you can really get quite close to the subject. So if you if you turn it all the way to the minimum focusing distance, i.e., so all the way to the right, and then on that scale there, you see you're at the minimum focusing distance, you, you can actually get really quite close to the subject. So. For some of the hoverfly images, I've actually used that lens and an extension tube. Um, wow, I can't keep up with all the questions here, guys. Loads of questions. I don't think I've ever done one of these talks and had so many questions, so that is a really good thing. Uh, I know I missed one about owls. Now, if I do miss any questions here, I will have a look back through the questions um, tonight, and I will um, I will sort of try to pick them up so you would see that reply pop through in your notifications. Um, best way to take pictures of owls. I know not technically garden wildlife. I may get to some owl images later on because I, I did find some which was about a two kilometers walk away from my house. Now, I, I've never photographed owls at night. Um, I'm, I'm not that keen on the idea of flashing um, nighttime animals. Um, I've only ever photographed them during the day. Um, and then during the day, it's sort of no different to any other bird really, other than the fact you have to be um, you have to be really cognizant of the fact that they have amazing hearing and they're very aware and you don't want to spook them. Um, uh, best way of taking photographs of hedgehogs at night? 
like I say, I'm I'm not keen on flash. So if I was photographing hedgehogs at night time, um, I would use a little LED light. So you're not you're not st sticking low, you know, because if, if you flash nocturnal animals, it does leave them it does leave them blind. Well, if you use a little uh, an, an LED panel, something like that, um, you, you you're not sort of um, completely ruining their night vision. So. Um, I haven't used this for hedgehog photography, um, but this thing here, um, a LuxPad 22, or any, any of the LED panels um, will do. I was going to cover mushrooms in a little bit, and I've used um, LED panels on those. Crikey, it's 12.41 already. <laughs> so, um, more hoverflies, going to skip. Um, I did show these when I did a talk for Camera World last year, but they were they were my best garden find. Um, uh, last my best garden macro find, sort of uh, when I first got back from Sweden last March. So these were juvenile wolf spiders that I found on my garden fence again. Um, and for these guys, you really did need a macro lens. So for these, I was using my uh, Canon MPE sixty five. Um, and extension tube, so I was shooting all the way up to um, um, I was shooting all the way up to seven times magnification. But you can actually see my house reflected in the um, in, in in the wolf spider's eyes. So I mean, that was um, yeah, that was my favourite macro shot that I got out of my garden last year. Uh, just some more questions, Sean. There, uh, when taking photographs of birds, are you focusing on the eye or the body? Very good question. I am focusing on the eye. Um, so previously, so um, I had been using a Canon 5D Mark IV for a lot of years. So I will just spend a little bit of time talking about the the, the difference there. So, um, so on this camera, what I would do is if I had a bird in front of me. I would use um, an individual focus point and I would move it over the bird's eye and that is how I would focus on the bird. Um, that has since changed with I'm using the Canon R5. So with the Canon R5, um, I just I tell the camera that I want it to focus on eyes and I want it to focus on animals' eyes and then either the Canon R5 or the R6 will then just lock onto the animal's eye and that makes life so much easier, it has got to be said. Oh, excellent, Wendy. <laughs> uh, so Jackley has a tawny owl in the garden. Oh, God. Uh, do you recommend a particular camera? Well, that camera I just mentioned, the R5, um, is are absolutely amazing for fast moving birds um, and that, that's one of the strange things when you're doing a talk on garden photography um, I, a, a lot of the images I'm showing you are, are not necessarily my best images because they're things I, I photographed in, in, in the garden um, but I, um, I went and photographed some little owls that were a bit of a distance away they were in Birmingham um, after the first lockdown when we could travel and the um, the Canon R5, uh, that locking onto the eyes is is just unbelievable. Um, it works really fast. Uh, why did I go for the R5 and not the R6? Um, that is, I I I do sell some of my work as big prints, so I really wanted to have the 45 megapixels fill was the, uh, the the key answer on there. Uh, Joyce, did I focus that for the wolf spider? I did indeed. Um, that was a focus stack I did using a focus rail, etc. And yeah, I'll 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 go into uh, more detail on that on the on the talk on the on the six. So and then so uh, this is so when I just showed you that video at the beginning of my garden, um, and I showed you that there was a number of shield bugs about. This was so. This is the the most recent picture in the in the deck. This I photographed last week with the um, with the R5 and the MPE65, and I've done a handheld stack of the shield bug. But the um, the level of detail um, you get out of those forty five megapixel files um, is absolutely staggering. So Phil, that probably um, that, that 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 probably covers why I sort of went for the R5. But the R6 is is also meant to be a very very good camera. 
So th things I've learned from doing photography in my garden, um, you know, uh, think about the image I want to create, which um, sometimes means a picture requires a full strategy. So, and what I mean by that is, you know, I, I mean, I'm just looking out the gut into the garden now, I can see a blackbird digging in through uh, at the side of my shed. Um, you know, I can see something which happens um, in the garden and I'll grab my camera and I'll go photograph it, etc. And that's all good. Or uh, something can happen like where I found those wolf spiders and I set up a specific project and I, you know, I spent hours on photographing them um, just to, because I, I wanted to, uh, you know, if I go back to it, that, yeah, this was, I, there's a whole load of sequence of photographs in these, but I spent that much time on them because I wanted to get as much detail in those reflections as possible. Um, so, you know, they, they were pictures which required a full strategy and a, and a, and a number of days to, um, um, to, 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 to realize it. Um, you know, uh, other things, you know, composition is the most important element um, to a picture in the garden, um, and being in the garden gives you more time. Um, you know, I, I, I learned some time ago that in my view, composition was the most important element. But, you know, if, if you're if you're in the garden and we're having to spend more time in the gardens recently, you know, it, it gives you time to work on that compositional element um, and to think about, you know, what makes a good composition versus what makes a bad composition, even though it's, it's, yeah, it's down to you as an individual. And what, what it does as well is, you know, you know, photographing hoverflies flying around, etc. You know, it, it might not give you, you know, it might not give you pictures which you're going to get you know, National Geographic buying them off you. But what it's absolutely going to do is is really develop your photography skills. Um, you know, people, um, when we're talking here about, you know, what's the best way of like in hedgehogs, how do we photograph a barney owl that's moving too fast? Because these things are in the garden, um, it, it gives you loads of opportunity to be able to practice and practice and get some of those, um, get some get they get to that point where you've got photographs you're really happy with but what it's allowed what it allows you to do is develop those skills so actually once you were back out on nature reserves etc um you get to land those stumble upon moments better i mean i uh, my first ever published photograph was um was four kingfishers sat together that i photographed at fairburn ings and that was a stumble upon moment where i i, I was out walking a dog uh, walked past the dike, looked down, and there was four kingfishers sat together, um, looking at my camera with me, and that was what I call a stumble upon moment. And the more you can develop your skills at home, the more you've got chance of landing, you know, de de delivering good results when you have one of those great stumble upon moments. Um, if I had, I had a walk last Friday, um, I didn't take my camera with me, and I, I saw a, an egret flying around, and then it came down to land. I, I was like, I wonder what I was doing. And uh, I looked a bit closer and there was a heron there. And then I noticed a, a raven as well. And then this raven and egret trying to borrow, uh, bother the heron. And I noticed the heron had a big rat. And if I'd have just, if I'd have had a camera with me, I'd have had a moment of a, a heron chucking a rat up and gulping it down with these two birds trying to scare it. So I didn't have a stumble. On, I had a stumble upon moment, but no camera. Um, another thing we, I was talking about as well is... Um, you know, you, you can learn a lot about how to be sensitive to wildlife um, because if it's in your back garden, you know, the birds are going to come back, etc. But you can sort of, you can learn what, you, you can you can learn to be more sensitive with the wildlife because, you know, you, you, you can see sudden movements, etc. The birds, the birds move. You sit still, um, they, they, they will, they'll more or less come to you. So it, I think it's a good way of sort of learning the, that sort of sensitivities around wildlife. Um, uh, you know, something I've learned that time out in the garden can be much more valuable than time on the internet. Um, yeah, some of the stuff I've done um, this year got sort of Canon's interest where I was using some new tech off the R5, doing 8K video of um, something in the garden, cropping it to 4K, learning that new technology. Um, yeah, time out just out there doing stuff and practicing skills is is yeah is, is much better than just being on the internet, as he says, talking to people on the internet. Um,
So practice makes perfect and the garden is perfect for that. Let me just check how we're doing for time. Crikey, officially I've only got 10 minutes left. Um, I, I'm okay if I overrun slightly, so I hope you guys are as well. Um, I think if, um, like uh, we said, the video is going to be recorded. So, um, you know, if you do have to drop out, feel free to um, to come back in and listen, listen later as well. Um, so in the house, I'm going to cover these bits quite quickly because I want to get to the um, bird feed a bit as well. So in the house, just almost a bit more like joke photographs, but these actually are in my house. Um, so this was, um, I, I'd actually been to the bathroom and while I was sat in the bathroom, I noticed this little jumping spider um, and it's actually sat on a toilet roll. Um, so I went and got my camera and of course, of course photographed it. This was taken quite a few years ago and before I used to stack images. So even though I've used flash and a smaller aperture to give a bigger depth of field, not as much of a jumping spider's in focus. Um, and this one, um, I don't know if you guys, you won't actually better see it, but just here is a glass desk. And this jumping spider, I, I saw on my glass desk just by my computer, uh, went and grabbed camera and, and photographed it on the glass desk just where I'm stood now. So, and th these guys will start to come out quite soon in the house. All of your houses will, um, will, will have jumping spiders in. It's just a case of spotting them. So I found them on tables, like say toilet rolls. You quite often see them on the walls, etc. So, you know, just in the house as well, keep an eye out for jumping spiders because they're, um, they're, 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 they're great to photograph. So, and I'm going to cover this bit quite quickly, not my garden. Um, this is in a, a sort of a local stately home garden that I was visiting in the autumn time. It's just two minutes up the road. Um, but it got some wonderful amethyst deceiver mushrooms in. Um, and funnily enough, um, I was also getting macro at the same time. Um, and if you'd see this, I'm not sure exactly what it is, whether it's some type of springtail or something, but there's a, a macro subject underneath the mushroom. And just to sort of zoom into that a little bit more, uh, there it is. So, and then another, another amethyst deceiver. So with these, I was also, I was using an LED light just to put a little bit of light on them. Um, I always photograph where I found them. I don't sort of pick mushrooms and, and move them around. I just photograph them where they find them, but really fantastic to photograph in the autumn time. Um, and this, this frog's in my dad's garden. Um, yeah, so if any of you have ponds, ponds are something I've not even mentioned at all other than just this one little bit. This was taken in my dad's garden. Um, and so if you have ponds, you're going to have sort of frogs and various other, other, other creatures there too. And, and this is a, just the last two out of a, a, another garden, but not my garden. Um, and this was, this was before, um, before lockdown. This was in a friend's garden. And I, I'd been out doing some photography. And this friend of mine knows what I like to photograph. And I'd always wanted to photograph a wolf spider um, with um, spiderlings. And this friend of mine knew, knew that. And he's, he phoned me up and he's like, Oliver, if you come over to my house this morning, I've got uh, two female wolf spiders on my patio with... Um, with, with wolf spider spiderlings on her back. So I went round and uh, here, here she was. Uh, uh, yeah, great to see. I'd wanted to see this for ages. So things I'd uh, never even seen in the garden before. So um, these were from uh, December time and um, I'd, I'd heard of globular springtails, um, but I'd never, I'd never actually seen them. And then I started seeing them in my garden um, this, uh, this winter. Um, so these guys are absolutely amazing. They're, they're about about four millimetres long. So these guys are super tiny. Uh, Sean, what f-stop are you using um, for the macro? Again, it's it's a complex answer. Um, generally, for my handheld stack stuff, I'll be shooting at about f4 um, to let a reasonable amount of light in. Um, if I'm doing stuff on a tripod and there's no wind, I might be shooting more at about f6.3, um, but I'll, I'll cover the macro one off in a lot more detail when I do the, the macro talk, but that give, gives you a rough, a rough guideline. Um, <clears throat> for, these, um, for these guys, they never, they never stop still. Um, so these were, these were stacks 
but I, I, I again I was having to shoot shoot quite quickly. But because they never stopped still, I thought, um, ah, well maybe I should start doing video of them. So bear in mind um, this guy here. <laughs> Pause that one there. So bear in mind, he's about he's about three four millimeters long, and his head is nowhere near as long as his body. So his body is about um, his head, sorry, is way less than a millimeter high. I mean, these things are absolutely tiny. So what I did is I um, I videoed this in eight K, um, and then I, I I sort of cropped. I zoomed into the video using crop, and then that allowed me to do four K. Um, 4k output of globular springtails effectively 10 times magnification if that makes sense but i know it's a bit geeky and then just to um just to put them to scale i put a five pence piece um on my garden fence on its side so these sterations are the the side side view of a five pence piece and uh, here's a globular springtail um, eating my garden fence uh, next to a five pence piece. And up until this winter, I had never even seen a globular springtail in my garden. Um, I have a small pond. Is it possible to shoot through or on the water? You can certainly shoot through water, Anne. Um, if you, uh, I've done this photograph in newts before. Um, if you put a polarizing filter in front of the lens, so funnily enough, I have a polarizing filter on the, the fence over the, um, on, on the shelves over there. So if you, um, I haven't got the attachments here, but if you clip clip a polarizing filter to the front of the lens. Um, and then you adjust the polarizing filter. You can cut out the um, the lens glare, so you could photograph newts under the water. Um, that is a tip I have done before in the past. So tips for springtails. So you can find springtails um, any time of year. Um, they're actually the most distributed creature on the planet um, in terms of how high up on mountains they can be found versus deep under the ground. And they reckon there's an estimated 100,000 in every one cubic metre of soil. Um, they are absolutely tiny though, and um, I didn't really get to spot these until I'd been using a magnifying glass on them. Um, and But now I've been using a magnifying glass on them, I've sort of got my eye in for them, um, so I can find them. But leaf litter can be very good for finding them as well, so sometimes people will get leaf litter, put it in a, um, a, you know, in a plastic tray, see if anything sort of drops out of it. But if you do that, obviously put them back where, where you found them in, in the first place. Um, but they, yeah, what, one thing I discovered is they really like my garden fence this winter. Um, and they, they're really good for practicing difficult macro because if you can photograph springtails, um, they are, you know, they are a very hard macro, photog um, macro subject to photograph. So, so we got to feeders, so I, I will cover the feeders section for sure. Um, so I did, um, so what, what I've got here is just um, 10 minutes walk from my house in some, in, in just in a little patch of wood, put some feeders. So I just wanted to show you sort of the setup that I'd put in there and then, you know, some of the images that I've got out of it really. So I did this uh, little video clip. Hello there, so I thought I would just do um, a quick video clip to uh, to go with one of my talks. Um, I'm at my sort of bird feeding site. Um, so I just really wanted to sort of show you what the setup was and I would then have a go at photographing some birds. I've already got a few grey tits and blue tits flying around pretty close. Um, but yeah, we'll go from there. So the setup is really easy. Um, a couple of bird feeders. Chain there just to make them squirrel proof. Um, got fat balls, uh, seeds I forgot to bring up with me, and I just sort of filled up the nuts ones there. Um, and then we just got a little sort of table thing there, put some mealworms on. Um, camera kit over here, it's all ready. Um, my little three legged stools, so I'll be sort of sat there um, and then just photographing the birds when they come in here. Really easy setup. 
Um, you know, key things to think about is how much light the place is going to get. It's a pretty cloudy day today. Um, what your background's going to be, and it's pretty windy today as well. It's not really perfect, but I just wanted to show you the setup. Waiting really, um, have your camera on, um, all your settings ready, um, check your exposure. Just make sure you have all the settings right. So that's everything from that perspective. And it's just a question of waiting, really. You just gotta sort of sit here and wait. You probably think I'm really close. Um, to be honest, that really doesn't matter that you sort of sat fire, not moving. You see now why I've got the uh, little three legged stool. Um, it's just a question of uh, waiting for the birds to come in. So here we get um, a grey tit, uh, blue tits, robins. Uh, we've been getting loads of long tail tits as well. Um, but it's a nice place just to sort of sit down, uh, relax, watch nature. I've got a blue tit just. Oh, I hadn't realised I'd just cut it on the blue tit piece. Um, but yeah, I just wanted to give you a sort of a view of, um, of, of the setup that I use there. Um, so somebody just asked about, uh, Stuart asked about extension tubes and springtails. I, I actually don't use extension tubes, but I use this lens here, the Canon MPE 65, which allows me to go from one times to five times magnification. So it's, it's, like, um, it's like almost like a reverse lens on a variable extension tube, just to answer that one. If I'm using extension tubes, it's generally more when I'm shooting with, with other lenses. Although occasionally I'd use them with the MPE as well. So, uh, what food is best to attract robins? Uh, robins quite like fat balls, um, but they robins love mealworms. Um, and also just sort of, uh, mealworms is, the, is definitely their favourite. So, well, one of the things I've... Um, I, I haven't been photographing birds that much for the last couple of years, so it was really quite good fun to spend some time um, at, at these feeders and yeah, to spend some time back on, on bird photography. And I, I found out I went for either one or two different types of shots, um, which was either these ones, which I actually don't mind it if there are lots of messy branches about, as long as you've got sort of a clear eye and you've got something which forms a composition. Um, but then I also found that I, I'd either do so I'd either do this type of shot or I would do real portraits. Um, so when you house, how far were you from the bird feeder? One of my camera Canon 12D has shut sound. Um, again, if if you if you sort of sat there, they, they will get used to a shutter sound. Um, they will fly off to start with for sure, but they will get used to it. Um, that is, is, is what I found. I mean, I, I I found I do sit very close to these feeders. Um, I mean, these robins are ridiculous. So some of these robins I've been photographing with a hundred mil lens. Um, you know, to um, to Sean's point about mealworms, they love them. They they really do. And you know, robins you can get eaten out of your hands. But long tail tits, I'd always thought were were birds that were um, were a real scaredy cat. And I found if I sit there. Um, and don't you know? Don't really move. They're not really not that bothered. So, I've been finding I've either been doing these like habitat type shots, um, which you know I I don't. A lot of people are like, oh, I don't really like other branches, etc. In the in the images, but I, I don't mind them. And it's yeah, it's how the birds how the birds live, as long as it has some type of compositional merit. Um, or I've been going more for portrait shots. Um, but one thing I would say is whenever I do these habitat type shots. I always make sure that the direction the bird's facing, there's a lot more space for the um, for the bird to potentially move into as such. So if you if you were to imagine the bird taking off, it had space to fly into that. So I am going to go through these quite quickly though, because there's quite a lot of them because I've been doing quite a lot of it. Um, but I do love photographing on um, on robins. Um, and the feather detail you can get when they when they get quite close. But uh, like I mentioned at this site, also get great tits coming in, uh, blue tits. And again, you know, it's I'll have a go for this environmental type portrait. 
um, or, or this, this, this close-up portrait, uh, which I really enjoy. Um, but I want to get through to some further Robins. Um, yeah, there we go. So we were talking about um, stacking um, and how I've done lots of stack. I, you know, I've been doing stacking with macro photography for, for many years now. Um, and I had a, a bit of a different idea this year, which was, well, could I try stacking with birds? Um, and I'd done some, I'd done some with uh, with kingfishers, um, which I hadn't put into this because they're sort of they're outside of that remit. Um, I never get kingfishers in my garden or just up the road at the local wood. Um, but I did manage to do it with these robins. So here's a single shot, and here's a stack shot. You see, um, on the single shot, you know, I focus for the eye, so the eye's in focus. And then on the stack shot, boom, the, the, the whole thing's on net, not, not the whole thing, but you've got a much bigger depth of field. Um, now, I, I can only, just with the time, I can only really sort of broach on, on how I did this. Um, but what I did is, on, on, the new, um, on the new mirrorless cameras, on the Canon... Um, well, you can do it on the um, Canon RP as well, and the, um, the Canon R. So on on the newer mirrorless cameras, you can do this thing called focus bracketing. <coughs> so you tell the camera um, what's the nearest point that you want the um, the camera to start focusing, and then if you've got focus bracketing on, you can tell it you want it to take five shots, ten shots, twenty shots, a hundred shots, and you can tell it the size of the increment you want. Um, and uh, that that's what it does. So what what I would do is I, I was um, I was needing to use a tripod for this and a remote release. Um, I would try to have everything set up. I would have live view on on the back of the camera. Um, the robin would land. Um, I would quickly sort of get the sort of rough composition I wanted. Touch on the back screen on the robin on the bit which I thought was the closest to me, and then use my remote release, and the camera would just like fire off a burst, and hopefully I would get enough to stack the image. Now, if I go all the way back to that disclaimer, some people might say, "Oh, I don't really like how that looks." This was purely an experiment to see whether I could start to do um, stacked pictures of birds, and the answer is I can. This one's a stacked one as well, so I've got a much bigger depth of field much more of the birds in focus um, this one stacked as well um, and the amount of detail it pops up is um is is, is quite ridiculous okay. what size increment would you use on a robin i used the smaller size increment that i could do on the menu system i just moved it all the way to the left um, and then I, I think i set it to 20 pictures for it to take 20 pictures and the r5 does that in one second if you're on electronic shutter mode um, but I didn't use all 20. I maybe used the first six or seven. And invariably what I'd find is the robin the robin would have moved as well at some point. So, you know, you, it, you don't tend to get it first go. Um, but it's it's fun to try. And again, it, it just you're developing those photographic skills. It, you know, whether you, you know, whether you end up using the end result or not, you're developing those photographic skills for different situations. And here's a robin single shot. And here was a stack shot. So on the single shot, there's you know there's a limited amount of the bird in focus. Um, both feet are in focus. Stack shot, much much more detail. Again, no right or wrong answer. Um, it's just a technique you can um, you can do. And if you've got you know either in your garden or a very local patch while we've potentially got more time, it, it's an advanced technique you can you know you, you can try to try to try to master. And then we had that snowy spell just a couple of weeks ago. So uh, I was back up there um, photographing the various different birds in the snow. Uh, much fun. Um, as this is the first winter I've had in the UK for seven years, um, normally I'm in northern Sweden. It was quite nice to have some snow. Great hit in the snow. And then I'm sort of going to finish off on these uh, long tailed tit images. Um, so I. I, I I've come to adore long tail tits by sitting on that little three-legged stool. So I'll, I'll be sat there and you can hear when they're coming in because it'll be this like sort of, I can't do the noise. It's sort of like little, 
tweety ping noise and all of a sudden it would be getting up to like 13, 14 of these long tail tits coming in. They will all be pairing off about now, so I'm not sure I'll get them in the same numbers. Um, but just the cutest, cutest little birds. Um, quite often looking at me, and again, I, I thought these were going to be super, super shy. Um, but yeah, I, I, sitting still, I found them to be really not that shy at all. And I never knew they had gold coloured um, eyelids until this year. Um, I, I actually posted um, these out on um, Twitter about who knew that long tailed tits had gold eyelids. And um, um, some bird scientist came back to me saying, actually, they don't just have gold eyelids, they can also. And, they, they have different coloured eyelids when they're um, as chicks and when they've just fledged and then when they become adults they actually have variable colour eyelids so the colour of their eyelids will change depending on what mood they're in believe it or not but yeah great to spend some time with them and work in progress um, one of the things I really wanted to try and do was get um, pictures of long tail tits in flight and yeah, I've got them, but they are um, they are not good enough by any means. Um, so you know, like I said, we we're, we're all we're all always learning. Um, that these long tail tits are so fast. Um, I haven't managed a way to get the uh, eye focus to keep up with them yet. And then for whatever reason, they always seem to turn their heads away from me as well. But I shall uh, I shall keep going. So uh, tips for the feeders. Um, you know, if, if you put some out there. Um, make sure that you put them out in a place that you know they might not get vandalized um, or that you know or that you may get into trouble I think I meant that you might not get into trouble um, obviously you know you, you don't want to be putting them on people's land as such if um, you know you've got to make sure there's somewhere where you can put them um, or you've got landowners permission etc um, make them as squirrel squirrel proof as possible because you know you're not there and squirrels will be there um, obviously you know don't leave mess um, you do need to and this is the same with the garden as well you do need to make sure you occasionally clean feeders as well especially with avian bird flu around we don't want to be passing that around and birds are um, susceptible to um, to different illnesses that can pass from each other um, and, that, and I can't stress this enough as well you need to make sure that you can sit really really still so you know, and and to, to be able to sit to sit still, you need to be warm. So you'd have seen in that video, well wrapped up. Um, you know, think about what you're going to wear. Uh, think about the angles, um, similar to the garden, the light, the time of day, the backgrounds, and sit ready. Have all your camera settings done. Um, have your camera up sort of quite high as well. What you don't want to do is birds to arrive, and then you'll be picking your camera up and waving it around because they'll all go. But you know, if you sat with everything ready, camera up, as soon as the birds arrive, just gradually put the camera to your face, you you know, they will be relaxed with you. So guys, I have overrun by 13 minutes. So um I am gonna finish it there. Um I hope you enjoyed that. Absolutely fantastic to be asked so many questions and I, I'd had a, com um, a conversation with Camera World earlier so they did let me know that um, R5s and R6s are in stock at the moment and they've got some special prices on two of the lenses I think it was the RF50 and the RF85 macro I know they said they were going to um, they were going to put some voucher codes in the comments so they may have already done that um, Kim sitting still hard work I, it is for me as well actually I am I am not very good at sitting still um, so it was uh, lovely to virtually uh, meet you all. Um, like I say, I'm doing another talk for Camera World and Canon on the 11th of March. Um, and that, that one's going to be totally about macro. Um, I think I, I'll just be focusing it on macro that I did last year. And I'll be, I did a talk for Camera World last year on macro. I'll make sure it's all different subjects from there. But I'll be going into a lot of detail on the how I do it handheld, I'll be showing some videos, I'll be talking it through, um, and I'll be doing some on um, using the tripod as well. So, um, so great, brilliant guys. I'll, I'll hang about here for, um, I keep looking at this computer, I should be looking at this computer, but the questions are coming up on this computer. So I'll hang about for a couple of minutes. Um, so if I see any questions pop up then, I will, um, I'll answer them. Um, but other than that, Yep, see you later. Um, yep, yeah, like I say, glad for the questions. Thanks to Canon for sponsoring and to Camera Will for hosting me. And um, yeah, hopefully see you soon. 
I'll, say, I'll, I'll come back through the questions as well um, uh, later on tonight. So if anybody watches it later today and asks any questions in the comment, I can come back and I can come back and answer them. Brilliant. Right, guys. Well, I'm going to end, end the live view bit there, um, but I will keep an eye on the questions for a little while. Thank you very much. Cheers, guys. Bye now.